Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, just a quick couple announcements um, if you're new to Taco Webinars. Um, so we will be answering questions at the end of today's presentation, and you can type them in at any time on the right control panel. Um, and we'll do our very best to answer as many as possible at the end of today's presentation. Um, also, about an hour after the presentation is over, you will receive an email. Um, and if you complete the survey in the email, you'll also get the slides from today's presentation emailed to you as well. Uh, so with that, today our presenter is Dr. David Berger, and our um, topic is autism and cannabis. So thank you so much, Dr. Berger, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Hi, how are you? All right. So hello, everybody. Um, some of you may have heard me give an earlier version of this lecture um, last year, the year before. Um, and I also gave a similar lecture at the TACA conference last in, 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 uh, um, last year in Atlanta. Um, this is an obviously very evolving conversation. So while there will be some repetition here, there will also be some new things presented. Um, and one of the things that I will definitely be hitting on is especially a lot of the stuff in the news that you've probably heard about, about some of the concerns that are coming out with vaping. And we're going to be talking about all that, too. But for those who don't know me, I'm a board certified pediatrician. I'm down in Tampa, Florida. Um, I've been a lecturer at Dan conferences back when they were Dan conferences to MAPS conferences and TACA conferences and have been part of the community for approximately 20 years now. Um, and I'm, um, I've probably worked with about 2,000 to 3,000 kids on the spectrum at this point. Okay, so um, if you can make out this squiggle, um, the, the image on, on here, um, this was something that actually a colleague of mine had um, said to me that he found when he was archiving medical cannabis history. And he just happened to have found that this was a prescription, as you can see from April of 1902, that was written by a Dr. Berger. It wasn't me. I certainly wasn't alive 117 years ago. Um, but um, I just thought kind of, he just thought I was kind of funny that even back then that there were Dr. Burgers who were literally prescribing cannabis. As you can see here, this was actually an indigo strain that was being um, suggested here. So I, we just thought that was kind of a nice way to start off to know that how, how long that this has been going on for that we've been, that this has been used as a medicinal treatment. So as you are probably aware, there has not been a lot of research done on medical cannabis. A lot of this has to do with the current scheduling that the FDA has for us um, with cannabis, making it very difficult to research because according to the FDA scheduling, we are, this is considered a substance that has no medical value whatsoever, which of course pretty much everybody believes is not a true statement and hopefully the FDA will be changing that. Um, there has been some big studies going on in Israel, which I'll be sharing to you later on. Um, but we do know for sure, I've seen it plenty of times, that medical cannabis can calm some children um, and making some kids more educatable, which are, of course are very important things for people on the spectrum, as well as the significant reductions of anxiety and of a lot of negative behaviors, violent behaviors, etc. although there are some people who can make more anxious as well. And I am referring to both CBD as well as THC with these comments. Um, we will make more specifics as to the differences between later on, but both of those ingredients, I have seen those types of medical and behavioral types of improvements. Okay, we have seen better sleep, um, a lot of GI improvements, of course, a big thing in our, in our community, but you know, certainly things like Crohn's disease and, other, and ulcerative colitis and, and other types of colitis and celiac disease have also been shown to get symptomatic improvement using medical cannabis. Um, I have seen reduction and even some patients completely stop having seizures and been able to, on many, many patients, reduce seizure medications as well as most other medications. In fact, probably the most common side effect that we've seen with medical cannabis is a good one, which is the lowering of pharmaceutical needs. Um, but one of the things that if you've ever heard me lecture before, and this is true for everything that we do biomedical, but for certainly here, that with everything that we do, especially if there's not a lot of research available, would be to ask ourselves, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And we all make that decisions. And for one child, the answer may be one answer. And for another child, it may be another answer. I'm a huge believer in parent instincts. It's a question that I bring up all the time is what does your instincts tell you? And so, but it's a very helpful thing. But one of the nice things about both forms of the cannabis 
is that the benefits from the dose that you give should be seen the first day, as well as if there's anything negative, you should see it the first day, as well as also if you stop doing it, the effects either way would go away quickly. So that's also a really nice thing about it is that you can you don't need a lot of time to assess if what you're doing is a right or wrong thing. Of course, the dosing may not be right. And for some things, you want to give things a few days, but still, overall, it's kind of a nice tool that you can do that kind of um, timing and know quickly what you're doing. And part of my nasal sounding every now and then, you might even hear me blow my nose. I apologize. I am getting over a cold. <laughs> okay, so let's have some definitions here. So uh, cannabis is a whole um, genus of flowering plants. Okay, uh, they and then as you'll and also includes hemp is also considered cannabis. The two main ingredients that you've probably heard about is CBD, um, cannabidiol. There's no psychoactive euphoric properties to this. A person cannot get high from using CBD. Unless the CBD itself was synthetically made, all CBD products would have at least a trace amount of THC in it. Same thing would be true for THC products, if, unless they're doing some specific isolation. And I guess if they're doing a specific isolation, but anything that's going to be in a whole f um, flower, so like a CBD producing or a hemp plant, will still have some THC in it. Again, not enough that would make a difference in terms of the effect, but it's measurable. Now, you will also be hearing about other forms of cannabinoids. These two that you see listed here, CBDA and THCA. They are kind of like the pre four. Time or heat activates them. So uh, THCA is interesting because it has some effects that THC does, but also until it's heated or the THCA is converted to regular THC, which is actually called 9 delta THC, that again, there should not be any um, psychoactive uh, activity there. So a person who takes uh, a, uh, a cannabis flower out of the ground fresh and were to consume it right away or juice it right away should not have the same effect that whereas if you heat it but yes if you let it sit around long enough and let it dry out time will what's called uh, decarboxylation will also make that happen will eventually time will turn it into um, the active form of THC even if heating has not taken place you will hear about different types of, of strains, and now these are not specific for all people, and there's some people who even believe that these symptom definitions don't really exist, although in my experience, it has for the most part, but of course, also, as most of you have identified, not everybody would react to a pharmacological agent, be it a, a SSRI for depression or a stimulant medication the same way, and of course, the same thing is true for a lot of the biomedical things that we do as well. But most people will tell me that indica has more of a calming, relaxing, sedating type of effect, also good for pain. A lot of people use them at nighttime, whereas sativas are typically more energetic, stimulating, and uplifting and more used during the day. And some people may not even be able to sleep well if taken at night. Um, some people have told me the exact opposite effect happens, that the sativa brings them down and that the indica knocks, um, knocks them out. My best friend tells me he can't tell the difference. He says that they all work great for him, but... Um, he can't tell the difference. They have a different taste, but in terms of the effect, he says that there's nothing different. Then you'll also hear about hybrids. These are cross-pollinated plants that have both indica and sativa properties. So if an indica is too sedating, but a sativa is too stimulating, then a hybrid might be the right answer. Now, you'll also hear about other forms of cannabis like ruderalis. It's a low THC, high CBD plant. The reason why it's not used and why hemp or modified forms like Charlotte's Web are used for the CBD is that they're small plants. And so they don't yield the same type of crop. And so in the, in the agriculture field, obviously, you want to get as much yield as you can for every acre or potted plant or whatever you do. So that's why you don't hear it. But technically, that can be used as well. Now, hemp is cannabis sativa, but it does not have any of the THC. I don't hear people talking about hemp having more of a stimulating effect. So there are probably other things, other cannabinoids and terpenes that do make the sativas act that way. But hemp is naturally high in CBD and low in THC.
Then the other main ingredient, you'll hear about other minor cannabinoids as well, THCV, CB, um, CBG, CBN, and they also have different effects as well. These products are just starting to come to the market now. There's not a lot of availability, but I do anticipate in the next few years that you'll be just like you hear about. You can get a THC or a CBD product that you'll be getting other products that are high in those other ones as well. Some are better for pain. Some are better for sleep. Some are better for increasing appetite. Some are better for decreasing increasing appetite. Um, then you'll also hear about terpenes. Terpenes is what gives the flavor and smell of the plants, but it also can um, affect some of the attributes as well. So for instance, there's a terpene called limonene, not like lemons. And in fact, most cannabis products that have a citrusy name to it, orange, lemon, lime, um, uh, mandarin orange, those types of things. Usually those are high in this one called limonene, which is particularly helpful for a lot of kids on the spectrum. Because limonene seems to help with a lot of attention and focus issues. I have had patients using high limonene strains come off of stimulant medications just by, with using that. That did get the effects with ones that were lower in the limonene. So that's an interesting thing. And we're learning more about these terpenes as well. And terpenes are not specific only to cannabis. In fact, any fruit and vegetable or plant that has an odor to it, those are the terpenes working for those plants as well. Okay, now we're going to talk now about how this works in the body in the first place. And to understand that, we need to talk about the endocannabinoid system, which is a system within our body, like we have a neurological system and a gastroenterology system. All vertebrates, so not just mammals, but all vertebrates and even some lower life forms and vertebrates have cannabinoid receptors. We all have it on all of our brain cells and our GI cells and on our immune cells. THC affects the cannabinoid receptor directly. CBD more modulates the action of the receptor itself. Now, CBD will increase the body's endocannabinoids by slowing down the body's breakdown. So we have, as you can see down the bottom, two naturally produced endocannabinoids, anatomide and 2-AG. So our bodies are making these. Furthermore, we also have at least two, in fact, they're discovering more now, cannabinoid receptors on our cells, CB1 and CB2, okay? Um, and as you can see, so the CBD is more of the influencer, whereas the THC is the more direct action. That may in part be why the THC has those different and more stronger effects. Okay, so CB1 is more found in our nerve system. Okay, it's stimulated by those natural endocannabinoids, as well as by THC. And that's what gives the people that high, that psychoactive. Now, interestingly, CBD can block the CB1 receptor from having the effects of THC. So there are people, and I've seen this many times now, who can, would take THC, but because they're taking a good dose of CBD as well, they won't get that psychoactive high feeling. I've had people taking five to ten times the dose of THC, a dose that you would think would get an elephant high. But they're telling me that they're, or they're observing of their kids. No, they don't seem to be that as way, but it's the CBD that blocks it. And that's the reason why when introducing these things, no matter what, I always say bring in CBD first. Bring in THC if you don't get the effect, but always bring in the THC while you're still doing the CBD. So that way you can decrease the negativity. Now, the CBT, CB2 receptor is more functioning of the immunological system. Okay, um, It has immunosuppressant, and that's why it's really good for autoimmune and hyperinflammatory conditions, which we know a lot of our kiddos have. Um, it's also involved in what's called apoptosis. So we all have what's called pruning, and certain cells die, and certain cells are born. Um, it has some, may have some tumor suppression activities, too. We do know that there are, there are, that there are can be strain-specific cannabis that actually can kill cancer. I have seen a woman personally who we did not use any chemo because she was too old the doctors would let her for and her breast cancer has disappeared and there's no other explanation for it so we have seen that as well now it also the cbd2 effector re regulates pain sensations involved in other diseases as well of course a lot of our kids are have some level of pain mostly gi and of course they can't communicate with us and therefore they manifest it as behaviors and so we sometimes do see of course if a pain and you know if a, if a kid's behaving better was it the pain itself that was better was it the behaviors because of the brain and of course we wouldn't really know that uh, but of course if people are doing better then that's the most important thing Okay, the CBD2 is also found in our peripheral nervous system. So those are the nerves that are throughout the body, not just the brain. 
as well as in our GI system. Okay. Um, my, you know, from a um, professional perspective, um, I had first started to learn about CBD from a, one of my patients who was having seizures. The parents had um, had brought her in. Actually, the dad had started taking it, and his anxiety and depression had really disappeared. And then when I personally was starting to study for my recertification for my boards five years ago, for my pediatric boards, and I started having panic attacks and insomnia with all these medical thoughts running through my brain, I was, like, ready to lose it. And this dad had say, hey, you know, why don't you try it? And I'm like, well, at this point, i got to try something something. And sure enough, that very first night I slept like a baby, my anxiety was gone. And it was really quite a spectacular experience. And then also, and I wasn't trying to treat it, but my carpal tunnel actually disappeared that very first day as well. Um, when I woke up when my hand wasn't all stiff and numb and I wasn't having shooting pains down my arm. And I know that wasn't a placebo effect because I was not treating that. It just happened that way. Okay, so in terms of, so now uh, little, this is a little bit about the Florida story. Every state is different, as you know, but we are seeing a lot of similarities happening from state to state, especially the new ones that are coming online. Um, and we've, some of the states have been remarkably similar, like Pennsylvania and, fall, and following the Florida model. So when we originally, originally were allowed to use it, there were just a few different um, treatments that were allowed, uh, diseases that we were allowed to treat for, and this was only for CBD, and you see them listed here. Then in November of 2016, that's when the statute in Florida, um, uh, pardon me, when the constitutional amendment happened that allowed us to start using THC as well as CBD for other treatments. So that's where this is here. And you can see that there are all these different conditions. However, you'll also see this very important one where it says other similarly debilitating conditions. Now, if one were to look at all of the symptoms associated with these conditions, pretty much every cro other chronic debilitating symptom is on here. So people with PTSD have anxiety attacks and negative behaviors and violent behaviors like a lot of our spectrum kids do. People with Parkinson's syndrome, a uh, Parkinson's disease, excuse me, a lot of them have communication difficulties. They get to a point where they can't talk and apraxia, certainly a different reason than why people with autism have difficulty speaking some. But nonetheless, one certainly can't say that the debilitating aspect of not speaking with Parkinson's is more than the debilitating aspect of, of with autism. They're both debilitating. So that's why we call them similarly debilitating. And that's what's allowed us. And obviously, a, a, you know, things like Crohn's disease allows us to cover for all the GI symptoms. There's even something called HIV associated neurocognitive disorder, of which the three most common symptoms are low, low, are, um, are inattention low focus and hyperactivity, which of course that which isn't that ADHD. So any of the ADHD types of symptoms were in Florida were allowed to use that. Now I realize in other states you may not have that type of availability, but that's how we use this similarly debilitating um, clause. And again, and I kind of went over that in a little bit more detail, some of those specific symptoms. And of course, if you go across the board here, you will certainly see, hey, isn't all of that together kind of like under the definition of, of, of what we see for autism? You know, you know, tremors, um, certainly a little different. Our kids don't have tremors, but, you know, tremors as a movement disorder, similar to stimming and hand flapping and some of those things as a movement disorder as well. And again, that's how I'm even if a kid's stimming or if a kid has tics, verbal tics. Um, you know, um, physical ticks. Again, that's how we're able to get those covered as well. Okay. Um, now, this is a particular article that came out a couple years ago that basically reviews the entire medical history of marijuana use relative to pediatrics. So if you ever have time, do you want to read through that? And uh, we'll make my slides. I know you're seeing this, but in the presentation uh, will be available. If anybody wants a copy of these slides, I'll send them along to uh, Taka, and they can also send them to you as well. Um, but it's kind of nice that they went through there for recommendations, you know, um, to go through these things. Okay. Now, many people have seen these products over the counter. You know, at least in Florida, you can buy them anywhere from gas stations to Whole Foods to everywhere in between. Um, there's a lot of buyer beware here in that um, a lot of, you know, states, similar to pharmaceuticals with the FDA, there's a regulation aspect that they, you know, for testing for both purity and accuracy. The quality of the purity and accuracy testing that they're doing is better than pharmaceutical grade. So there's two issues there. Obviously, it's a plant. Are they growing it with pesticides or are they growing it with ladybugs? You know, when it comes to accuracy, if it says that there's five milligrams in a, you know, five drops or five milligrams in a capsule or five milligrams in a gummy, 
Is there really an is it of THC or CBD? Is there something in there that you don't know? When they've tested these over-the-counter products, they may have no cannabinoids and a bunch of other stuffs in there as well. You may It's also difficult to figure out what the, what's actually in them because now you rarely will see how many milligrams of CBD. It'll say things like total cannabinoids or hemp parts, 20 milligrams. Is that really 20 milligrams of CBD? And is are they checking batch to batch to make sure that there's consistency? Okay, it's like you wouldn't want to, you know, if, if a person was taking Ritalin five milligrams, you wouldn't want to just say, hey, here's some Ritalin. Is it five? Is it 10? You kind of want to make sure that it's accurate. Okay, um, and so those are really important, you know, in Florida, which, are, you know, they've actually declared that hemp and CBD is only legal if it's from a dispensary. Because, um, and we'll get a little bit more into the farm bill and that you guys have heard about that as well. But there's some issues that are going there that makes a lot of physicians kind of not comfortable with those products because of the way that they've stated the laws in a given state. OK, but again, they should be checking every single batch as well as making it available. So what you can do is you can ask a company if you are going to try something over the counter uh, to see their last three certificates of analysis. If they're not willing to give it to you, I would run away from them as soon as possible. If they are, what you want to see is how often are they checking. So if they've done three checks within the last six to 12 months, they're checking it with regularity. If it's three times that they're giving you over the last decade, they're obviously checking it not that often or they only want you to see the good results. OK, so that's important for to see all of that as well. OK, this is one of our Florida companies called True Leave. And, uh, and the, what you can see here is for every single batch number and every single type of product, you could actually see and I'll, I'll, I'll blow one of these up in a second. But this is just like what, what, I, what I, was, I can capture from their one website. Now, like, you mean, it's like pages and pages and pages of this um, where you can actually see that they're checking by the batch and you can match it up to your label. OK, so what you'll typically see is something like this where they have the different cannabinoid ratios. So here, Delta 9 THC, you can see how much is here, mostly CBD. So this is pretty much a one to one ratio of CBD type of product. OK, these are some of the minor cannabinoids and like a little bar graph, a little co color code there. And that, that's the other thing here. Whoa, sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. Excuse me. Let me go back. Whoa, that was totally not supposed to happen. I apologize about that. Let me quickly, how do I go back when I'm in the share mode? Okay, I'll just click on it like that. You can still see. So basically, as you can see here, like these are different organophosphorus, like, you know, pesticides types of things, but they're, you know, but, uh, you know, so you can really kind of get in and see what they're doing here. I'm going to go back to share mode and hopefully that'll work. Not share mode, excuse me, present mode. Pardon about that minor technical difficulty. Um, okay, so, and again, so not just on pesticides, but other solvents. So, you know, solvents are what are used to remove the, um, especially when making oils and capsules and stuff, they're able to, so, you know, they'll use ethanol and other types of things to extract, but then they want to make sure, do they remove it all? So, like, ND means none detected. So, they were, even though this was an ethanol extraction, you can see it was all removed. OK, they should be checking for bacteria, especially because it's a plant form. Heavy metals. Again, they're checking for mercury and lead. Right. That's what we would want to make sure our products are being checked for. Mycotoxins. Some of these, um, pro you know, because they're flowering plants, they could get moldy again, wanting to make sure that they're done there. So that's really nice to see that. OK, so now routes of administration. And, uh, you know, so it's important to understand that anything that's swallowed first has to go to the liver. Uh, and that's it before it goes anywhere else. Now, in the liver is where it gets metabolized. So not some, but all, but it all will eventually get metabolized in the liver. Now, this form that's the active form called 9-delta-THC, when it hits the liver, it gets converted to this other form called 11-hydroxy-THC. It's more psychoactive. You may have heard people, like if they ate a brownie or if, they, if you've ever heard someone overdoing it with cannabis, it's almost always the swallowed form. And of course, because it also takes an hour to kick in, a lot of people have made the mistake of taking, giving, or taking a second dose before the first dose has actually kicked in, and then the second dose kicks in, and that's when problems can occur. So taking it a very slow and not adding extra doses the first day, so you know what really happened, is important too. But some people can take thirty minutes up to two hours to see the effect when you swallow it. Now there are different oral versions. Tinctures, capsules, oils, suckers, gels, baked goods, etc. If a tincture is held under the tongue and allowed to absorb there, then it won't all go to the liver first. You'll, there are also now like sprays into the cheek that you can work that you can use as well. 
Um, nasal sprays, again, don't go through the liver. Um, suppositories, again, don't go through the liver and they get fast acting. Um, they can be used vaginally for, um, for cramps. Um, from what I not for the autism world that we will we have found that actually has increased um, libido um, as well as I understand that it actually serves as quite an aphrodisiac as well okay now why am I not getting that um I'm sorry I'm jumping backwards let me see if there's a marker here I can do to make that stop oh wait there we go okay sorry about that Okay, um, skin. There's topical forms. Those work more at the site of the application. They give their pains locally. It's a transdermal goes through the skin into the bloodstream. Patches can be a very helpful thing for kids on the spectrum because it's a small amount being released all day long. So especially for school purposes, etc., where you're not going to be giving an extra dose. Um, in Florida, as well as most states, nurses aren't allowed to give cannabis to people, um, to patients, even if they have a medical note because of the whole... It's a school thing, federal funding, so they don't get involved with that. But it can, but it, it's it's very. I've had some very good effects from patches as well. Of course, smoking and burning it, which is actually not allowed in Florida for kids. It recently did become available as flour for adults to smoke. Although I don't think anybody should be smoking anything, regardless of whether it's tobacco or banana leaves or anything else. Now, vaporized oil are used in what are called vape cartridges, which I'll show you in a moment. And also, one can vaporize the flower. So it's not smoking it. It's at a lower temperature. The cannabinoids are released at a lower temperature than when it's burned. When a person vaporizes flour, what goes in green comes out brown, but it's not ash. Kind of like, um, like uh, fall leaves. It gets brown, but it's still – you can tell it's a leaf. So – in term, so this is some of the stuff that I want that I'm adding now, uh, concerns about the vaping and, of course, what you may have heard in the news. Okay, so, so far what we're hearing, and, you know, this is, you know, um, I'm definitely giving the FDA credit. I don't always give FDA credit for everything they do, but they do seem to be Johnny on the spot with this, um, with this in terms of the investigation of trying to figure out what's actually going on. OK, what it seems so far that they've been able to determine is that it seems as if these are really happening mostly from street products and not from dispensary types of, of products. Um, there is questioning whether there is some ingredient that's in the solvent, some um, pesticide, some type of other ingredient that's making its way into the products. That may be it. But at the same time, we have no idea what inhaling oils for 40 years of any of us were going to do. So, you know, certainly, you know, um, most people don't have this problem. Certainly, you know, the concept of vaping oils has been happening for well over a decade out west. And this seems to be a brand new problem that they're identifying. And certainly the use nationwide of cannabis hasn't gone up. In fact, they've even shown in kids, incidentally, most states who bring medical in, actually, the, the use in, in, in youth in general has gone down. Vaping of, of like jewels and the, of the nicotine, that's another issue altogether. Nicotine itself, incredibly addictive, whereas, as you may be aware, THC and CBD are not physically addictive. You may be dependent on them because you feel better when using it, just like a person may feel better when they're using low-dose naltrexone or when they're using Zoloft or whatever. But And so if you stop them, you'd get worse too, but you wouldn't say that you're dependent on those. You'd say they worked, and so I like to think of CBD and THC in those same ways. OK, but as I said, the dry vaping, in my opinion, is the it would, would using the flour and vaporizing it is, in my opinion, the best safety as well as combination of effectiveness of out there eating it and swallowing, it, obviously, as well. It's just more the, the time of action and that liver conversion. Now, this was an article that just came out yesterday. This link that you see here from NBC News, um, I will probably be converting this into multiple slides over my next presentations, but I didn't have time to yesterday. But this is a. I, I thought this was a very, very well-written article that really, you know, as we've seen with so many things, especially the news with vaccines, as to, like, how jaded and um, and subjective and that, that they are and opinionated. And I didn't find this one to be that way. I thought it was very well put together, explaining everything up to where we're at at this point. So it's just a good summary overall. But certainly I have lots of people who are vaping who are having no problems whatsoever. So, um, and, you know, so, you know, and the, and the, and the, the amazing thing about the inhaling is that the effects are going to be there in one to two minutes. 
So if I have a kid who's having a seizure, they could stop it almost immediately. If I have a kid who's having a tantrum, or if I have a kid who knows that there's going to be a problem because of transition, you have to make a stop at the store that you weren't expecting. And you know you don't have an hour in order to get it to kick in. That's where the inhaling can realistically come in fantastically. One of the um, you know things that I'll show you a picture in a second, they now have it like an asthma puffer, like an inhaler, like a meter dose inhaler, which of course, if your kid's having a meltdown in, in, a, in a supermarket, you hand your kid a, a like a, a meter dose inhaler asthma like product. No one's going to give you an evil eye. If you give your kid a vape pen, especially a three year old kid who's having a tantrum, someone may look at you kind of interesting. Although certainly most of us in the autism family have realized long ago that we really don't care what other people say because we're going to do what's best for our kids. Um, but but anyways, it's it's more and more information that's coming out. So this is another company that we have here in Florida. It gave me the opportunity for me to show you some of the different varieties and a couple things to notice. Okay, that first of all, these are all capsule products, but notice that there are different strains. This is a 50 milligram capsule, a 10 milligram, 25 capsule. So when I talk to my patients, when they're giving me information as to what's doing, so I can do patient education med management, I always tell people think in terms of milligrams, not capsules, drops, or anything else, because there can be different, but a milligram is a milligram is a milligram. There we go. And now these are different um, oral solutions. Again, you can see 20 milligrams per milliliter, 10, et cetera, 25. You know, this one is a blended, et cetera. So again, thinking in terms of milligrams, you will always get it right. OK, now you will hear about what are called distillates and concentrates. These are probably best if you're going to be doing baking where you put uh, in, and you make it into like 100 different doses. So like if you put a thousand milligrams into a, a batch of brownies and you make it into 100 small pieces, 10 by 10, then you now know you have 10 milligram brownies as an example. But with these, if you try to squeeze out a little bit of it, it's probably going to be too much um, of, a, of a dose at once. It's certainly not to try it out. So I tell people in general, Avoid distillates and, and concentrates um, so that um, at least when you're starting off, because you can't really get a small amount in. Then you'll see nasal sprays, etc. There's one called Canacol. This is a milligram spray of THC straight for the nose. Again, fast acting because it's, again, going through the nasal lining a little bit slower than um, inhaled, but certainly faster than swallowing it. And again, not going through the liver. Then you'll hear about vape pens, okay? Some of them you'll see pre-filled. Some of them you'll see like with a battery, with a cartridge that fills in. Again, this is a nice way of showing it because here, this particular company, you'll see different ratios. This is a five to one more CBD to THC, a one to one, one to nine, so mostly THC, et cetera. So therefore, you could kind of like gear which from that perspective in a pre-ratio. However, I do recommend not starting with a ratioed product because you can't increase the one component without increasing the other component. I'm going to blow my nose for a second. This will be gross. I apologize. <sighs> Sorry about that. Okay, I can breathe again. Okay, now you'll also see companies that have more of these like pod-like cartridges. It's a similar type of thing. They'll all typically have this button that you push. Um, again, these are the patches that I had talked about. Um, some of them are actually like, um, it looks like more like a, um, a Band-Aid type of pad. Some of them have are like actually very thin like um, baggies, like cellophane, that you can see the oil. Ones that have oil cannot be cut because it'll just leak all over the place. Ones that look like a Band-Aid often can be cut, although I would check with the manufacturer or the dispensary um, to find out for sure for a given product. But like, let's say if you want to give a five milligrams in a patch, but it's 10, then, you know, again, if you cut it in half, that obviously would be good. Okay, now vaporizing. Many different products that are uh, hardware on the market. Um, basically for all of them, you know, again, you put in something brown, out comes something more on the, uh, I mean, you, in goes green, out comes brown. This is more of like a handheld device where like they have lightings that tells you when it heats up. So it's green when it's good to go, when it's heating up. You'll also see products like the Volcano where the cellophane bag gets filled up. Um, these are more, I find, useful in the recreational world because to fill up one of these baggies usually provides a big dose for people that probably most people would find is a little bit more than therapeutic, but I'm showing you the different options. There's a lot of many, many, many different options that are out there at this point as well. Okay, so in terms of how we introduce this, as I said, I always like to start the CBD first. I typically go oral first because if I can avoid inhaling, I prefer to avoid inhaling. Also, typically, the oral forms are going to be cheaper than patches and some of the more advanced forms. 
Um, I always tell people to start in the morning first just so you can see how it's going to go for the day. I'll typically start off at three times a day, and that's all, and, and for sure three times if I'm having a sleep issue. Some people can get away with twice a day, although some people um, may need it more often than three times a day. It depends on how fast that they metabolize it. But I do recommend waiting two to three days before increasing the dose or even adding another product, not because you won't see the effect the first day out, but you may have a good day or a bad day on that particular day. And so if you give yourself two or three days, you have a better chance of just making a good observation before you're making a change. Okay, if I'm doing the strategies, I'll typically start a very sensitive people and young people um, at two to three milligrams of CBDs. That's like if I'm dosing like very young children. Um, more often, I'll do five milligrams and making jumps of five. So I'll go five, then 10, then 15 milligrams every few days. But a teen or adult, <clears throat> I have no problem with starting 10 milligrams. Um, if you look at what the dosing that's now being recommended um, by, um, that's now being recommended um, with the pharmaceutical version, which is called the, um, sorry, which is called the Epidiolex, they're talking about starting at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, which means a 22 pound young baby, they would be talking about 25 milligrams as a starting dose twice a day and quadrupling that, which are doses that I've never even used before in anybody. But that also tells us that we know that those high doses are safe. Okay. Now, when I bring in THC, if the CBD alone is not sufficient, <clears throat> and I do find that a large percentage of people on the spectrum really do best when a little bit of THC, sometimes more than a little bit of THC is brought into adding to, this, to the um, CBD, okay? Um, but as I talked about having the CBD there so that the THC um, effect, that negative effect won't be seen or be minimized. Um, you know what I tell a parent is if your kid's more happy and social, which is kind of like what some people will use at recreational for, there's nothing wrong with that. But if your kid's seeming zoned out, looped out, stoned, then obviously that's not good and that's not acceptable. We can't do that to our kids. Um, interestingly, though, if you vaped or inhaled CBD, if you had too much THC, it can serve as an antidote, which is really neat as well. I've seen it. I've seen people who took too much THC um, accidentally orally. Um, you know, who are off for a few hours and then start inhaling CBD and five minutes later, they're back and talking. It's, you know, not kids on the spectrum. This is a, an adult patient of mine, but I saw it happen um, personally. Um, but, uh, but time does reverse it if nothing else is done. So pretty much when you go to bed, you get a reset button every day, which is nice also. Again, if I'm dosing the THC, you'll see instead of me starting off at two to three or even five to 10, I start off at much lower doses and I increase by much smaller amounts as well. Okay, you will also hear about what's called microdosing, which is taking very, very small doses of THC, maybe one milligram at a time every hour. That should not be enough that would get a person that um, psychoactive effect in the first place, but, it's, but it can have different effects on people as well. Um, and some people like it better, so that's another way of doing it. And the patches themselves are kind of a way of providing the microdosing small amounts throughout the day as well. Um, also, we find that if you take two days off of all CBD and or THC before microdosing, it seems to work better. Also, if you if a patient is doing well on cannabis, but over time it seems as if it's wearing off, they need more, it's not working as well. Sat the receptors can also be saturated over time and taking two days off and then resuming can kind of kickstart everything back to the beginning. And uh, there are some people who will even take it and then just take a week, a weekend off a month, just automatically. Or some people wait to see if the effects are wearing off, then they take Tuesday, two days off. And those are certainly both acceptable as well. Okay. Um, and then again, starting every hour. And then typically if one milligram um, per dose didn't see a difference, then you go to two milligrams per dose each time. And of course, you make these still very small doses um, going up. Now you can see here, but typically once you get more than three to four, you're not really micro dosing at that point anyway. Okay, so now when we talk about strains, so we were talking before about sativas and indigos, but if you check out, now this is more talking in the um, THC products, but you'll hear about all of these different names of strains. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them have the recreational name, and so it's kind of unfortunate as a physician to be telling somebody, hey, why don't you take some train wreck, or why don't you take some green crack? That's one of the names of them, which is 
Yes, I just told my patient to take green crack. Well, lovely. Um, so I would love it if they had more different names than that. Just call them all rainbows and sherbets or something. But uh, but some of them do have names that I would not necessarily want to tell a kid that they were taking that name because that would sound kind of weird. Um, now, there's a lot of um, availability sometimes by region of where they're able to grow it. Um, some dispensaries are, have proprietary blends, etc. But you should still be able to find out the different terpenes and the different cannabinoids for a given strain, different batch, etc. Now, I have not found that anybody says to me, oh, what is the best strain for autism? I don't think it exists. It, again, is going to go more towards the type of symptoms. You know, some of our kids on the spectrum are really chilled, almost like too chilled out and aloof. You know, that may be somebody who needs something more stimulating. Whereas if a kid's super duper jacked up, you may they may do better with a um, with an indigo or an indigo leaning dominant uh, hybrid type of strain. So again, it's going to be trial and error, keeping good notes like I know most of you do, where you have your spreadsheets and your logs and keeping track of everything. But I tell my patients, you know, write down every day what you did. At the end of the day, do a scoring scale of one to five. You know, it, you know how how bad is the symptom? You know, make your own scale one to ten. It doesn't really matter. Do it for each of the major symptoms. This is the pain, this is the sleep, this is the appetite, whatever, and um, and then you can really kind of modulate. Maybe you find out, because not always is more better. Hey, I was doing better two weeks ago. What were we doing then? Oh, that's what I was doing. Then having that kind of reference is, makes it easy to go back to something. Okay, now there is this amazingly good website called leafly.com. It's like the Wikipedia of cannabis. Anything you'd ever want to know about cannabis is all on this one site, and it's very reliable. <clears throat> Pardon me. And one of the nice things that you'll see when you click on the strains section of the menu, you'll see where it comes to these different symptoms that you can see here or conditions. OK, so if one were to click on them, then it takes you to more information. So, for instance, I had already pre-programmed for you those with anxiety. OK, now what you'll see here, you notice I have this checkbox where it says results near Tampa. If I would have unclicked that, that could have had a couple thousand, but these are the ones local to us, so it helps us do this. You'll see that this one, with the best one that's actually rated is a, the red one is actually a um, sativa. If you can read that, it says there, the purple is the um, indiga, and the greens are hybrids. So, and then also what you, what this, what you have is if you um, were to click on it, you can actually see which dispensary, what locality has it there as well. But this is kind of a nice way of knowing what, what's being rated the best for a particular symptom. Now, another thing that you'll hear about is called the entourage effect. Okay, and the entourage effect is what happens when all of the different ingredients within the plant are together. Okay, as opposed to an isolate. So, for instance, you'll hear about, you know, so what you'll see here these are, for instance, particular symptoms and the different cannabinoids, um, et cetera, that help with them. So like you can kind of go around the circle and say, oh, um, let's see, for instance, if I was having a kid was having seizures, okay, you know, I will, and epilepsy, I want to be focusing not just on THC, on CBD. I really haven't seen much with actual THC help with it, although you can see it's very good in the Tourette's kind of tick world. But these other ones that I mentioned before, THCA, CBN, THCV, there could be other strains that are higher in that. And that's where, again, asking to see their certificate analysis to really know what's going on. Okay. Now, side effects. Again, little is known, um, especially on the developing brains of children. And, you know, we do think that T in, uh, THC can have a negative impact on the developing brain. Now, I realize that most of our kids with spe on the spectrum have issues with their development and, you know, we're and especially an older kid where we kind of, you know, um, where we haven't seen the, the, the hopeful complete resolution of autism like we sometimes see, but we've seen improvements. But we have an older kid who um, we really need to calm down, especially when the hormones are kicking in, when the puberty changes. We know how sometimes those can get very aggressive and violent. Again, everything comes down to the pro versus con, you know, show me where the wonderful safety is of Risperidol or some of the other medications that's used as well. Certainly, we know the effects of seizure medications on brains as well. So that's something that I tell people to always take into consideration and why I'm cautious about THC, but I'm at the same time, I'm not afraid of it. Okay, but it does seem to affect the younger the brain and the developing brain actually is developing until 22 years of age. And that's why you're more likely to see effects on brains on younger people versus older people. Okay, they have shown that with some studies in teenagers have shown um, that thinking, memory and learning function can be affected um, as well. So again, being cautious and using the smallest dose that you could possibly get away with. 
<clears throat> now, there are now studies that are going out for more of the longer term and bigger studies, etc. Um, and again, always taking them both into account. Most often, though, if you see a negative effect happen, and it'll last for a few hours, but also it does seem that if, unless you're using it long term and you're seeing something negative, even if it's a kid who's acting really, who seems like they're zoned out in stone, again, it's just going to be for a few hours, then it goes away. And they wake up the next morning, and then everything should be back in order. Now, there have been some studies done. There were some twin studies that were done um, where they did show that there was a decrease in IQ points for some um, between in the puberty years. But the interesting thing is that they found that there was no predictable differences between the twins when one used and one didn't. So maybe this had nothing to do with the THC at all, because why would that be? Maybe there was just something to it. Maybe to the studies themselves. Maybe kids with twins have lower IQs. They don't really make that up. Um, but again, the suggested IQ decline of marijuana users may be caused by something else other than marijuana, shared, you know, again, um, fact, other factors, family genetics, etc. Now, another study that was done um, in New Zealand um, and um, with researchers at Duke, they created, they came up with this thing that they called marijuana use disorder, where they did find eight IQ points lower. And again, this is with THC um, in, in younger people. Um, and that the lost mental abilities in those people didn't fully return. Um, but again, these were more people who were smoking it and who were using higher doses. I wouldn't expect one or two milligrams to cause what 10 or 20 milligrams would be causing. Okay, in terms of some of those other side effects that a lot of people have known about, altered senses, changes in mood, um, you know, um, impaired body movement, some people, especially this is more on the oral side memory um hallucinations i've never seen that happen before usually that's reported at very high doses etc etc we do tell people when we're counseling parents especially with thc or any patient whatsoever we do take a mental health family history and if there is a family history of psychosis of any form we are much more cautious it doesn't mean we stop with it but we're very on top of that we're asking those follow-up questions as well um there is a major study that's currently going on, called the ABCD study. Um, they're looking to get 10,000 kids into the study. They already have 5,000. And so that's obviously a very nice study where they're going to be looking both at the benefits as well as the negatives and, and combinations, etc. Now, there was a study from a couple of years back from Israel where they did look at 2,000 patients. Again, a very nice sized study, more than most a lot of pharmaceutical ones that you'll see. Um, if this particular, um, uh, and this was um, with adults, again, three quarters of the patient were smoking it. Um, I'm sure that should have been one fourth, not one fifth. Um, we're using other forms. Um, you know, the most common symptom that was seen, dry mouth, um, hunger. We know that it can be an appetite stimulant for people, and but some people, when they use it, they get the munchies. Um, a high mood, that's kind of the concept of being elevated. You know, um, that doesn't mean that's necessarily a bad thing. If you're down, you'd want to go up. Um, you know, some people can get insomnia from it, um, but only 10% of the people actually stopped the study, stopped using it because the side effects were too bad. Um, certainly, if taken early in the day, fatigue can be an issue as well. Now, um, some legal issues. And again, this has to do with on the federal level relative to the state level, and that's scheduling one that I was talking about. Um, the farm bill that was passed this past spring that allows for hemp, to be um, uh, is allowable. However, the C the FDA then came out the next day and said if a product specifically is listing CBD as the main ingredient in how many milligrams, then it's not legal unless it's been cleared by the FDA the way that um, supplements are. Okay. Um, and so, you know, in some states, the only, like in Florida, you can only use CBD legally if you have a card. Um, doesn't mean people don't get it. Doesn't mean that there's not some products out there that are perfectly fine to use. I have not spent too much time researching those just because in the state of Florida, knowing that if I'm recommending something that's illegal, that could be a problem with my medical license. So that's why I've been focusing mostly on the medical um, dispensaries that are local to us. One of the things, though, that I've been doing a lot and more and more of is I have been doing medical um, consultations um, and like what we call patient education um, consultations for people around the country who have access to these types of products, but they don't have anybody who can manage it and tell them what to do. And so that's something that I'm allowed to do also. And that's why, um, you know, but what I've also been able to do is if I know what your local sources are, I've even got online with people and shopped with them and talked about the specific products that are at their local dispensaries. And I can tell them how to use those particular products as well. So that, that I'm allowed to do because I'm in that mode, I'm in the education mode and I'm allowed to be an educator educational consultant and not practicing medicine and that's how I get away, why I, how I get away from any problems with the law 
okay? But as I said, you know, see all CBD, all hemp products is technically legal in Florida. My hemp wallet is actually illegal according to the statute. Um, I really don't think I'm going to get busted for my hemp wallet, though. Okay, so again, that's the Schedule 1. LSD and heroin are Schedule 2. Um, I mean, part of our Schedule 1, excuse me, so they, they consider it as dangerous as marijuana is LSD and heroin, which, of course, ridiculous. And they considered – so Oxycontin, cocaine, are actually considered Schedule 2. Now, I – anybody please show me how cocaine and Oxycontin are safer than cannabis. I'd love to meet that person, and then I'd like to institutionalize them for being uh, – for not having some um, some sanity there because there's just no way that you can make that um, – that you can make that argument whatsoever. And that's why there are efforts that are currently underway to deschedule it because even if we took it down to a Schedule 2, they could at least research it. Researchers aren't allowed to research Schedule One medications because of the fact that there's no medical benefit. So if they could at least take it down to a two, we could research it. Okay. Now that actually was changed. Also, there's actually something apps going through the FDA that started last week, where they actually did start that re that in terms of being able to research it. So they they they, they did. It used to be that Mississippi State University was the only legal place in the country where you could grow it, and it was limited to their strains. And anybody researching it had to get it from there through this whole application process to the government. Now they're making it that multiple people can be growing it, and so you just have to apply for that, but you don't have to get it through Michigan, uh, through Mississippi. So, again, that's the first step. Okay? In most states, we're not prescribing it because, you know, relative to our FDA, the, the law does say we can't prescribe a legal thing. So we don't prescribe it. That Most states say we're certifying, we're authorizing you for it. Um, and, you know, in, every state has different. So, you know, how much you're allowed to get per 70 days or how, et cetera. So every state has their own limitations as to what can be purchased. Um, but again, I tell people regardless of what it is, how to do it. Um, now, uh, the most important thing, of course, back to what we talked about before. What are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? Not just for this, but this is for anything. That is what the definition of informed consent is. Weighing the benefits, weighing the risks, weighing the alternatives, and of course, following your instincts. Now, people can be can sign consent. Like a lot of people, when they get when there's vaccines given, they give you all these forms to sign. Do how many people are actually informed before they consent? But that's not informed consent. Informed consent is when you are informed before you consent. So, okay, so that goes through my presentation here, and I, it looks like I have about seven more minutes. So um, I'm happy to take some questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so the first question, um, is oral delivery uh, proved to be the most effective? No, um, it is effective. In my, I mean, again, it's a matter of what gets into the bloodstream and how. Okay, so, I mean, it's a very effective way, but in some people, um, you know, I personally don't like the way I feel when I orally consume THC. I've had some bad experiences with it. I won't do it again, okay? I know people who it's the it's the end-all, be-all wonderful for them. So it's, it's way too individualized to do that. But again, part of it is what are you trying to accomplish? So also a lot of people do, you know, a lot of people have colitis types of symptoms, you know, chronic diarrhea. We find that giving them the oral form actually works better for those GI symptoms than inhaling it. It'll help with the pain aspect, but in terms of slowing down the gut, it seems as if oral form could be good for there. But do I, you know, but if I have a kid who's having a temper tantrum or a violent moment right now, that's when I want to use one of those faster actions, if not inhaling it, the transdermal gel is faster, the oral spray is faster, the nasal spray is faster. Perfect. And this kind of piggybacks off that. Um, my CBD oil says hold under the tongue, but my um, son will just swallow it. Will the CBD still be effective if ingested? Yes, it will. It'll just take longer to kick in. And a certain percentage of it will be broken down in the liver before it gets to the brain. So one, so like for instance, 10 milligrams under the tongue completely dissolved or absorbed may be the equivalent of eight milligrams as an example, making that number up because we don't know for sure and well, when, when a person swallows it. Perfect. The next question, my five-year-old child is considered uh, mildly autistic. He's improving dramatically. Do you, have you seen CBD oil benefit children who are high functioning? I have. I've seen, yeah. I'm sorry. Was there a rest of that? I apologize. 
Oh, he just said my uh, his primary behaviors are stimming, difficulty, reading social cues, and speech delays. Absolutely. And so on the social side, that's one of the really cool things. I mean, again, on the recreational side, it often improves people's social skills, um, at, but it does with here too. And it makes a person more comfortable, comfortable around people. Again, some of those transitions. And again, any kind of stimming, I've seen it help as well. But I've also, you know, I've seen people who have straight up Tourette's and people with straight up ADD type of symptoms who are not, would not be have a label of autism spectrum disorder who it helps them as well too. So obviously a, a higher functioning kid may be more described like that. But yeah, I have a lot of kids who would have had the old Asperger's label, now a high functioning autism label who, who have benefited too. Yeah. Perfect. And then we have a lot of questions. Um, this is Bruce pertaining to you. Do you do phone consults or any Skype consults for people out of state? Yes. So yes. Yeah. So I do both of them. Um, we actually set up our own, a separate business called Dr. David MD um, Educational Consulting LLC um, for that very purpose. And so anybody who wishes to contact my office, even um, if, if you don't find that company, if you just Google my name in Florida Pediatrics or you know, autism, et cetera. It's very easy to find me online. Um, and then just go to my office and just hit any of the contacts con ways and then my staff can filter you in for that. Perfect. And then um, a lot of questions about how to approach a doctor if they aren't really like gung-ho about this. If the patient's gung-ho or if the doctor's gung-ho? Do the if the doctor's not, um, not open as much as they would like to be about right. the Well, I'm gonna presume that most people who are listening to this have encountered a doctor who have had that about another treatment that we do biomedical. And so I would really kind of treat it in the same way. Interestingly, though, more and more doctors are becoming, ex especially in the CBD world, you know, while they may come up with the typical, oh, there's not enough research for it. They've all kind of, you know, you can certainly say, but what about the form that's been, F you know, we know that it's been FDA approved for seizures in much higher doses than we're talking about. So what actually is your concern? But I, I, I have not found very much pushback at all on the CBD side. I have gotten, you know, heard, I've heard some on the THC side, but I certainly don't think I've gotten more than I would have heard about chelation, you know, or some of the other things that we do. So, you know, it's kind of like finding a, a, a provider who's willing to work with you or as my, some of my patients do, it's a don't ask, don't tell thing. They tell the doctors what they feel is the important thing for the doctor to know, but they won't necessarily share everything. But that's ultimately, you know, while I'm a very open person, you got to do what's best for your situation. Perfect. Um, the next question, is there a better time of day to take it? Well, a, it, a, in part, it depends on the symptoms. Okay. Again, if it's just problem, I mean, if some people who have insomnia is the only symptom, they just take it at night, right? You know, if your problems or behaviors during the day, maybe you don't need it at night, you know, but, if, but most, but again, so it really depends on what you're doing. Some people may just have more situational anxiety. And just when they get into those moments of transition, it's, or, a speaking engagement or a large group situation that they could just use it as an as needed basis. Perfect. A um, couple more questions. My child has a lot of oral issues. Am I correct in understanding that the transdermal patch would be best? In terms of the effectiveness of helping the oral symptom, not necessarily. Obviously, if a kid has a taste aversion, you know, just like trying to get high dose vitamin A into somebody may not be helpful or, or feasible as well. You know, certainly some of the herbs that we've used don't have such a delicious taste. Um, but I would not say any more so than any of those types of things. Perfect. And then um, give me one second. Can yeah. CBD oil be used to treat pans or pandas? Yeah, for I mean, it's just, it falls under those same types of symptoms. So anxiety, absolutely movements absolutely behaviors absolutely so you know certainly you know for that matter if you were to go through the list of pans pandas relative to that list that i was showing you before you'll see that you're going to see all the same symptoms showing up there too perfect and then um last question can um i'm so sorry can you talk about uh cbd oil um, an appetite, do you think it would be helpful for stimulating an appetite for a picky eater? For some people, yes. Also, for some people, it may just make them eat better because their abdominal symptoms are better. Right? Um, and so, um, you know, but if somebody said to me, which do I, if, do I think that, which is more likely going to make that happen, THC or CBD? I would say THC products are more likely to give that increased appetite, but again, com combining it with the CBD. But I would okay. still try the CBD first. No matter what the scenario is, I would try the CBD first. Perfect. 
All right, um, that wraps up our webinar. And I just want to remind everyone, you will get um, an email in about an hour with the survey. As you complete the survey, you will get the slides. I know we had some questions on that as well. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Berger. We really appreciate all this information. Thank you for being on today. Absolutely. Have a good day, everybody. All right. Goodbye, everyone.